welcome back. In this sixth and final segment on elk hunting, we're going to talk about the rifle and elk cartridge. But rather than me just blustering and telling you what to go out and buy as the ideal elk rifle and cartridge, let's talk about what the elk is and what it would take to bring them down efficiently and with the least difficulty. A lot of people don't realize that the elk existed in what we would now consider all of the lower 48 states when the settlers first arrived, with, a, with a, possibly a couple of exceptions. I don't know if there are any recorded instances of elk ever in New Hampshire or in Rhode Island and a few other places, but for the most part, elk existed throughout uh, the continental, what is now the continental U.S. The, um, the elk were very quickly moved westward, in other words, killed um, by, by human intervention, and um, with, with black powder firearms, primitive weapons, uh, muzzle loaders for the most part, uh, they, they, brought, they brought elk to uh, very, very small numbers uh, by the time the middle of the uh, 19th century. So by the mid-1800, by the time of the Civil War, uh, most, most elk had been eliminated from the uh, east of the Mississippi. And um, not long after, elk were uh, left in very dwindling numbers by the time the uh, 20th century rolled around. In fact, it was so, it was so uh, desperate that, uh, well, the Miriam's elk was, uh, I don't know when the last Miriam's elk was, was last seen, but um, they, they were exterminated and extincted uh, in the Southwest, in uh, Texas and, and thereabouts. Um, Roosevelt elk is named after uh, President Theodore Roosevelt, who was president in the early 1900s, 1903, I believe. Um, and he was a he was a very very staunch con staunch conservative individual. Uh, <coughs> he he was a po he was a powerful figure. Um, you know, he rode the the uh, Rough Riders up San Juan Hill in Cuba. You know, in in a, in a famous battle, uh, and he. Um, he was a uh, very dedicated and staunch outdoorsman, and uh, he lived he lived outdoors for quite a while, and uh, in the Northwest, and he uh, established he established protection zones for uh, the elk, which later became became known as the Roosevelt elk, named after him. Um, he had a he had a very he had a very strong interest in conserving uh, a dwindling resource that the elk he, he could see that the elk was really a uh, threatened species, and so uh, you know by the time the turn of the century rolled around, there were places where you could no longer find elk where they had previously been uh, very very numerous. The um, the story of American uh, you know. The, the mechanical age, you know, the industrial revolution that was uh, going on in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, they simply didn't have the kind of money or time to, uh, to go hunting out west. Um, settlers moving west had pretty much come to a, come to a grinding stop. So there wasn't so much there wasn't so much any interest in uh, in controlling elk, which were in some cases elk were, were vermin to uh, to a farmer. You know, it, it, a herd of elk moving into a, a farm into a into a crop could uh, basically cause an awful lot of uh, financial damage. So a lot of a lot of elk were eliminated simply because they were uh, threatening uh, farmers in their in their uh, livelihood. But uh, so the elk did retreat to the more uh, isolated recesses of the Rockies and places where you know humans didn't really bother them, and that's where they that's where they survived for quite a long time. Then uh, the Industrial Revolution suddenly became the Great Depression of 1929 that lasted, uh, and during that period of time, nobody was hunting anything outside of maybe hunting their backyard deer uh, to uh, to bring home food for the family. Uh, but they, they certainly weren't traveling any place. And then uh, World War II uh, occurred right immediately uh, following uh, that period of you know, economic decline. 
And, you know, American men simply went, went overseas and, and they were fighting and they didn't have, they, there were no, there were no uh, people at home hunting. Those who were, le those who were left at home were, were working to uh, provide for, for the servicemen who were abroad fighting in, a, in, in war. So there was a, basically a period of almost 50, almost 50 years where elk were left alone and that, that profited them greatly and they started, to, they started to spring back. Then after World War II, uh, when, when uh, servicemen were coming home after 1945, Congress provided for them with the GI Bill, which allowed a lot of them to, a great many of them to, to go to college, something that they would not have otherwise been able to afford. Going to college, they, they, they now were coming out of places like MIT and uh, you know, going, to, going to work for companies that were getting involved with the uh, space program that was starting up in the early, six, in the early 50s. Um, and uh, so as, as, that, as that sort of uh, economic development started, people were moving to the suburbs, a lot of cash started flowing. And people had a lot of, uh, they had a lot of uh, expendable income. They, they, they had not only that, but they had just returned, they just returned home from being overseas. Uh, they, they, Europe was not that far away anymore. Uh, Africa wasn't that far away anymore, nor was, nor was Alaska. They could, they could get to these places in their head because they'd already been there. It was, it was a simple matter of getting back. And what's more, now we had, we had airplanes which were shuttling people back and forth. You know, TW, TWA was uh, using its uh, constellation during World War II to shuttle 3,000 flights back and forth uh, across the Atlantic, transatlantic. So between Pan Am and TWA and United Airlines uh, getting into the game, American Airlines, uh, they were flying people back and forth to Europe and to Africa so that they could go hunting in places which they had become uh, very accustomed to. So Winchester being very, very uh, fast on the pickup quickly recognized this. So 1956, they offered the 458 Winchester Magnum the 458. Now we're talking about we're talking about the history of uh, the cartridge development, and you'll see why in a moment. So they invented the uh, 458 Winchester Magnum, which allowed the use of a standard size rifle uh, receiver uh, to to push a, a very potent, uh, you know, African cartridge that was capable of taking down the largest game on the planet. And without, without some of the recoil associated with some of the rifles that the British had heretofore been using. So it was a, it was a very attractive move. Um, Winchester, you know, had, they always had, it seemed like the, 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 the upper hand when it came to marketing. Uh, they, they, were, they were always ahead of the curve when it came to marketing. They could foresee the future in, in many ways based on economic development. So by 1956, they had, they had developed that. And um, just two years later, uh, they, they developed the, uh, the, the two other cartridges, which would make it the, the super trifecta. They developed the uh, 338 Winchester Magnum and the 264 Winchester Magnum. And uh, I think that was, that was really rocking the boat for uh, the firearms industry. They promoted the uh, they promoted the the 458 as the African cartridge, the 338 was the Alaskan cartridge, and the the 264 was the Western cartridge. So they, they were they were covering it all. Now they already had they already had uh, you know the tip of the spear with the 270 Winchester for many years, which was a darling of a round and it remains so. Uh, that was that was a Great Plains cartridge. So they they knew they knew what they were doing when it came to marketing. The um, I mean, even when it came down to uh, understanding America's iconic fondness for the pony. <laughs> so they they always had the the Pony Express rider is on their le their logo. You know, just like Lee Iacocca understood that icon when he when he invented the Ford Mustang in 1965. 
Um, so there was always there was always that attractive interest to, to Winchester when it came to their new cartridges. Remington was a little bit slow on the pickup when it came to marketing. They had a genius for engineering. They they basically took they took a complex design uh, and they they looked at this model 70 action and they said uh, we can do better than that and you know they they came up with basically uh, a machined tube that screwed onto the back of the barrel uh, with little more than a few uh, millings and uh, so that that hurt Winchester in a in a in a bad way because um, you know Winchester was at the time producing firearms down in Connecticut where labor costs were high and everything. Remington is secluded up in the middle of Illion, New York, where you know labor costs were low, so they had they had the advantage there. The design of their firearm, the, the Model 721, uh, 722, and then later the the 700, uh, that was a, you know, that was a genius of engineering because they basically could manufacture something much much less uh, costly and produce it. Uh, very quickly without any without any uh, difficulty where Winchester was really stuck with their, their model 70 design that required a lot more machining and uh, uh, mill work so but Winchester did have Winchester did have the upper hand when it came to marketing so what what they lacked what they lacked in terms of uh, engineering genius uh, they they made up for in marketing so this is where we get down to the elk cartridge and, and the magnum, uh, the magnum thing. Understand now that elk had been moved westward; they had been killed uh, going westward for the better part of three centuries, and uh, there was no there was no issue with killing elk with uh, relatively primitive firearms. You know, muzzle loaders, you know, flintlocks and and percussion cap guns. And there's certainly no issue with killing them with the uh, earliest uh, smokeless powder cartridges in the in the early part of the century. That was never an issue. As a matter of fact, Jack O'Connor was writing about uh, hunting elk in the 40s uh, during during the period just before the war and and uh, throughout the war. He was writing about uh, elk hunting, and he was he was talking about elk hunting in very very uh, you know easy to understand terms. With the you know three hundred savage that was the in those days the th when you say you owned a big three hundred that meant you had a three hundred savage it wasn't the, the three hundred Winchester Magnum wasn't uh, that was a long ways off and the thirty oh six and the two seventy those those were all adequate elk hunting cartridges of the day elk haven't gotten any larger and they haven't gotten any tougher. And they haven't gotten any harder to find, and that they're not any farther away than they were in the '40s and the early '50s. But uh, you know, in marketing, the idea the idea of marketing is, and I've spoken about this before, is to is to get you to think, to believe, and with all sincerity that you need to have something that somebody's offering. That's the whole that's that's the whole point behind marketing is to get is to get the customer to believe that what he has is not sufficient and what he could have from them would uh, solve everything. So that's what Winchester did and the 338 Winchester uh, Alaskan uh, certainly uh, was not as, that was, that was not as big a scheme as uh, Winchester had originally thought. There weren't that many people going out to Alaska to hunt from the lower 48. But it became the ideal elk cartridge. Now, Winchester had to do a little bit of marketing shift because they knew that they knew that elk hunting was more uh, more popular than grizzly hunting and brown bear hunting. So, uh, rather than promoting the 338 Winchester as the grizzly cartridge and the brown bear cartridge that it was when they first introduced it, it was now the ideal elk hunting cartridge. Well. That was a that was a moniker that Winchester gave them, and the gun writers were very very quick to just pick up on that, and so it became the ideal elk cartridge. Nobody ever needed the three thirty eight Winchester Magnum heretofore. The three thirty eight Winchester Magnum simply became 
uh, self-proclaimed uh, elk cartridge by virtue of its uh, sales department. And so everybody, everybody picked up on that and then therefore it becomes what, what it was pronounced to be. So what am I saying? Well, the 270, the 306, the 280, they're just as good at, they're just as good at hunting elk as they ever, ever have been. Um, I'm going to fall back on uh, I'm going to fall back on my you know my association with uh, with people that I know who were great uh, hunters who had hunted a lot, and uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, Rob, my uh, guide that I hunted with, and I spoke with him for hours about uh, you know in our spare times spoke with him for hours about uh, his, his adventures in elk hunting. Now he had, for over three decades, he had himself hunted elk, uh, many dozen elk, um, throughout the, the western states, uh, all the way down to New Mexico um, and Arizona. And um, he also had uh, guided hundreds of hunts, uh, elk hunts. And he was also involved with uh, federal predation control. You know, he was he shot he had shot thousands of uh, coyotes uh, in a federal program to to help control you know uh, coyote uh, predation. So he knew his stuff, and he understood what it took from pers personal firsthand experience what it took to bring down an elk. So I asked him pointedly, I said, uh, at the time I, I was out there hunting with a 300 Winchester Magnum and I had also brought along my, uh, my 270 Winchester with 150 grain bullets and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I had brought both rifles out, you know, just in case one, one had, a, had an issue, I had another one to back up. And uh, they were identical rifles, they were both Seiko rifles. Uh, they were both heavy. They were both 24-inch barrels. I think it was like 23 and a half or something like that. But they were, you know, essentially 24-inch barrels, heavy, straight taper. Um, they were uh, Monte Carlo stock, you know, forward, forward sloping Monte Carlo. They were, they were not, they were not lightweight rifles by any means. With a with a simple uh, two and a half, two and a half to eight power. Uh, loop hold on them. Uh, they they topped nine and a quarter pounds um, before they were loaded. So they were no they were no lightweight rifle. Uh, and I and I actually regretted that I didn't bring along. I should have I should have simply gone with my wife's rifle. She had a Seiko Hunter with a 20, 21 and a half inch barrel. That would have been more than sufficient. A two seventy. Um, but anyway, I was toting that around and. Um, so I, I said, uh, well, I got, a, I got a 300 Winchester Magnum. He said, well, you certainly got more than enough elk medicine. And I said, yeah. I said, what's, I said what's, uh, what do you think are good rounds? He said, well, he says, the only thing, he says, I wouldn't, he says, I wouldn't use any 25s. He says, I've seen too many problems with 25s. They just, they, they're just iffy when it comes to uh, sufficient uh, expansion. You know, they're, they're a small bullet. They're a small diameter bullet, not much frontal area. They can have a lot of sectional density, you know, 117 grain, 120 grain bullets can have a good sectional density, but they simply, they can't have, the uh, sectional density is only about uh, just, just shy of 240, which is more, of, that's more for deer than it is for elk. As I explained in one of my previous segments on sectional density, remember, 240 is the ideal deer sectional density. 260 is and up is the ideal elk uh, sectional density. So, you know, you'll see many elk cartridges and the recommended bullets for them are in the 260s to 270s. And that's why is because they, you know, those, those are the bullets that are ideal, ideally suited for elk, such as the 180 grain 30 caliber bullet, the 150 grain 270 bullet, the 150 to uh, 160 grain uh, 280 bullet. Those are, those are good elk bullets. So, and we're going to talk about elk bullets too. But, uh, so he said, well, he said, uh, the, the, the 25s, he says, I certainly wouldn't recommend 25s. I said, what about the, like the 264? And he says, 
He says he's just seen too many problems with the 264. On, on closer shots, it's such a high velocity that he said it oftentimes would have explosive uh, impact when it first hit, but penetration was iffy. Uh, he, said, he said the bullets simply uh, had, had uh, they suffered penetration issues because of uh, bone structure. When, when they struck bone, he said the bullets acted erratically. So he wasn't, he wasn't fond of the, the 264. Uh, by by virtue of by virtue of that, it's the largest of it's the largest of the standard six and a half calibers, uh, six and a half millimeters. Um, you'd have to you'd have to look you'd have to look kind of uh, at the at the rest of the six point fives, and say well they're they're marginal, uh, based on his experience. Now that's not to say that a six point five you know won't take an elk. It certainly will. There's no question about it. But being a pragmatist that I am, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always one to say, you know, why get something as marginal when you can get something that's ideal? And, you know, there's no, there's no reason to, there's no reason to mess around with something which is, you know, borderline. We don't have to have borderline when it comes to hunting in this country. We have plenty of cartridges to choose from. So, um, I, my recommendation would be based on what he told me is to leave the 6.5s behind for what they were originally intended for, which was for, uh, you know, they were originally it was a, it was a military it was a military bore diameter, uh, and it, it's very popular is very popular in Scandinavia for taking their moose, uh, but you know, it, in speaking with the the folks that I have known in my life that have hunted both both moose and elk. They will tell you that large as they are and bigger uh, than elk as they are, they tend to go down a little bit more readily than an elk, which is a, a little bit more stubborn. So um, moving on up is the 270. The 270, he said, is a fabulous. In fact, he hunted most of his, most of his life. He hunted elk with the 270. So he gave a great uh, acclaim. He said the 270 is an elk killer. Uh, that would certainly make the 280 an elk killer. It makes the the 3006 has killed more elk than probably any other cartridge. Um, so any of those cartridges are great. Um, naturally, he said, well, the 300 Winchester Magnum is basically a it, it's a little bit more potent version of the 3006. He said the elk isn't going to be able to tell the difference. Well, that that just about ended the. Discussion. I asked him. I asked him, uh, "How's my how's my brother-in-law's 338 Winchester?" He said, "Well, that'll do it." <laughs> he says. So he says, "As long as he can handle it." Now that that brings into it the the other the other question is, um, "Yeah, it'll do it." There's no question about it. Um, the the other question is, uh, "Are there what are the negative sides?" Well, my brother-in-law found out that there was one negative side that, you know, in a, in a lightly stocked Seiko uh, synthetic with a stainless barrel, the thing, the thing kicked like a mule. Um, I mean, like a, like a mule on steroids. So it lends itself to a heavier, you know, a, a heavier gun. Well, a heavier gun is not exactly what you want to carry around out west or in the high altitude. So, um, it's a, it's an odd admix. Uh, if if you want to have a three thirty eight, you can have it. And it also the the other the other liability is that it it did create a lot of uh, excessive meat damage. Um, the hole that went through them wasn't wasn't markedly uh, bigger than uh, other cartridges will uh, create. Uh, it certainly plowed right on through. With a he had a, he was shooting two hundred fifty grain bullets that we had hand loaded um, so it plowed right on through and um, but the um, the the meat the meat damage was terrific uh, we figured that he probably lost 20 or 25 pounds or more of, of meat due to bloodshot tissue surrounding the wound uh, both the, the front the front and and uh, exit wound so that's that's a liability that some people might want to consider um, it's just one of those. It's just one of those issues, and remember that the 338 Winchester is the ideal cartridge because it was proclaimed by Winchester to be, and everybody else went along with it. Especially the writers who get, they get a little bit. They get a little bit of, uh, you know, a little kickback every time they they give a good word to these uh, companies. 
there's a symbiosis between gun writers and that means gun magazines, uh, you know, and sporting publications. There's a symbiosis between them and the, the firearms industry, whether it's ammunition or whether it's guns or whatever it is. Um, the, uh, the, the firearms manufacturers uh, have long ago learned that they, they, can, they can kind of uh, save an awful lot of advertising income by simply uh, you know, providing a profitable resource for the uh, uh, magazines uh, by, by putting in some, a few ads in the magazines and the, and the writers do the rest. The writers, the writers will just, they'll write some flamboyant article about some hunting adventure and they use their 338 and, and everything was just fine. Well, of course it was fine because 338 is absolutely sufficient. If they were taking elk with primitive black powder firearms with, uh, you know, with, with muskets, well, they can certainly do it with a 338. So that's neither here nor there. But the standard cartridges always worked, and uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't work now. So I'm not going to I'm not going to offer my favorites, but. Um, you know, if you want to have a cartridge that'll take elk within uh, 350 to even up to 400 yards, your 270, your 280, and your 306 will do it. Uh, and anything in that anything in that same ballpark will do it. And they'll all do it without uh, requiring you to have an extremely heavy gun to tote around. This would be all that's necessary. This this is a you know a featherweight with a pencil thin 22 inch barrel. The thing, that's, the thing that's nice about standard cartridges is that they don't require an awful long barrel in order to get proper, uh, in order to get proper velocity. Factory, factory standard velocity is reached with, with 24 inch and there's not much loss with 22 inch. So with 22 inch barrel you have virtually, uh, you, you have 90, 95% of the available velocity and you have a very lightweight package that altogether weighs just a little over 8 pounds. This gun here weighs exactly 8 pounds scoped. So, uh, and that's before the sling is on it. Um, that, that is available. You know, the Remington, Remington was very, very good about naming their Model 700 mountain rifle. The, the mountain rifle was on that same idea. It had a pencil thin barrel. Um, and it's, it's too bad that it's too bad that Remington has, uh, since, uh, you know, met his demise, but that was a fabulous, uh, mountain rifle that, that, earned its name. Um, available in, in the standard cartridges like that, the 270, 280, and the 3006, it killed many, many elk. So those are the those are the rifle considerations, and certainly Savage makes plenty of rifles in that in that same uh, model. Uh, any number of Kimber, any number of the, you know, pick pick your choose. They're all good. Um, you don't need to have an awful lot of, you don't need to have a lot of muscle to take down an elk. What you need to have is a good bullet. Now one of the things I want to show you here, this is, this is a 200 grain Nosler Petition, 30 caliber. That's the, that's the bullet that I took a uh, large bull elk with and uh, took them down without any trouble with the 300 Winchester Magnum. Um, but there was, one, there was one issue with it, and, and um, John A. Cleveland uh, talks about this in his uh, elk hunting book. This is what was left of that bullet that was found on the underside of the hide on the offside. This is very, very typical and very common. My buddy who, uh, my, my late friend who uh, hunted moose virtually every year up in, uh, up in Labrador, he would always come home with these. I said, how do you, I said, how do you manage to find these uh, bullets all the time? And he was shooting, he was shooting uh, moose. He was a small guy. He was only about five foot one. So he used to, he used to always hunt um, big Quebec moose up in, uh, Labrador with his 270, his Husqvarna 270. And he always found the bullet. And I said, where do you get there? He says, they're always under the hide on the opposite side. He said, they hit the hide and they just stopped there like a, like a catcher's mitt. And this is typical. So what was left of a 200 grain nozzle petition is now 103 grains. 
the rear core remains and the front is virtually all it's always the same it's always the same picture the the, the uh, front core uh, disappears and uh, the, the the copper jacket folds back and it and it leaves the the remaining core so uh, almost exactly 50 percent of its weight was lost on its way through now the good thing is is that they virtually always have worked that way um, and when I say they work they 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 do kill the, they do kill the game the bad side is that they don't get on the way through they don't get all the way through so if there is an issue with the game going down if for instance the the, uh, the vital if the vitals were missed if the if the heart and lung region was missed for whatever reason windage you know wind blew it off course or whatever uh, or maybe a bone kicked the bullet off course on the way through and that's one of the reasons why good bullet mass is important because mass is what sometimes will plow through when uh, sectional density alone won't so um, you know for whatever reason uh, if a bullet doesn't hit squarely where it's supposed to it's not going to leave a blood trail that bullet there uh, left only one spot of blood about the size of a quarter on the ground just where where I shot him and that spurted out the entrance hole and the rest of it was all internal bleeding so though he went down within 60 yards he you know he, he went to his knees within 60 yards and went down uh, if if I had if I had for instance for whatever reason missed my mark and hit him in you know behind the the diaphragm or something uh, he would have been just running like crazy without leaving any blood trail whatsoever. So that's that's the downside of the nozzle petition. Uh, there are but there are better bullets now. You know that that was quite a while ago, and uh, there were not so many bonded bullets back then. Um, you know, Spear has this hot core, which is a terrific bullet, but there are also so many others now: the nozzle, AccuBond, and many many others. So those are the bullets which you. Probably my highest recommendation would go to a bullet that retains uh, better than 90% of its bullet mass and its weight on the way through so they can manage to get through and, and use that sectional density to punch out a, a good exit hole that leaves a lot of uh, blood on the ground. That's, that's important because without, without, without leaving blood on the ground, you just absolutely have to get them down right there and then. And uh, that's, not always, that's not always necessarily the easiest thing to do if, if you happen to have something blow the bullet off course. Or if you should step out of the way. You know, sometimes that ideal shot where an animal is standing right there and you're just squeezing that shot off and at the very instant that the trigger lets go, you see the animal step forward. And at 250 or 300 yards, that means he's stepping forward with his, you know, his paunch is getting in the way or he's if it's an entire miss, that's no issue. But if you happen to punch him and hit him in the gut, uh, that's an animal that's going to run for a long time before he comes to a stop. And he may not come to a stop for you. He may he may he may not come for a stop for for a day or two, and then he then he becomes coyote uh, uh, food. So um, that's that's the story of the the cartridge and the um, and the rifle and the bullet. Um, you don't have to get too sophisticated for elk hunting. It's uh, you know it's as simple as it's as simple as getting one of your standard cartridges. The seven millimeter weight has been taking elk. It's you know it just it just simply chokes up on the on the range. The you know what can be said about the two eighty if you want to have a if you want to have a seven millimeter Remington Magnum, have at it. You know you basically have you basically have a. a nothing more than the same ballistics as a 270 with a slightly heavy, heavier bullet weight. Uh, and the 300 Winchester Magnum is a, is, a fine, is a fine cartridge too. Whether I figure I needed it, I, I, I doubt it because, um, you know, in the circumstances that I was hunting, there was no reason I was going to be taking a shot beyond the distance that a 306 or a 270 would impose. Any of those cartridges are capable of ta taking down an elk out to 400 yards if you're, if you're a capable shot. If you're, if you're able to hit that piece of cardboard I showed you uh, at, at whatever range it offers you in the field, if you're able to do that and if you're a confident and capable shot and you, know, you don't suffer from any uh, uh, flinches or anything like that, if you, can put a, if you can put a bullet squarely where you want to at those ranges, any of those cartridges will do it. 
A little bit about the ethics. I can't get off the topic without ethics involved. I really eschew any shots beyond 400 yards as simply being uh, just absolutely not necessary. You know, we're, it, we call this hunting. We don't call it shooting. Um, it's, not, it's, not a sh it's not a shooting sport. It's a hunting sport. And I, and I hate to see people, uh, you know, summarily uh, decide that they're going to shoot their elk. You know, they, they buy cartridges that enable them theoretically to shoot at elk at distances well beyond 400 yards. At such ranges, hits become problematic. They are not guaranteed. I don't care how good a shot you are. A field shot beyond 400 yards is an exceptionally long shot. A field shot beyond 300 yards for most people is an exceptionally long shot under field conditions. To be able to take a good, a good sitting prone or, or kneeling position and to, or, or, or an offhand position and to shoot out to 300 yards is a, that's a very, very good shot. Don't let any, I get so sick and tired, it makes me vomit when I read some of these writers, you know, they make it sound as if a 600 yard shot is something which is, it, it's a routine event. That is absolutely BS. A, a 600 yard shot is not a routine event by any means in the field. That's an extremely long shot. I recently had a, uh, I, ha I had somebody write to me and during this series, uh, you know, made a comment. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't understand why anybody wouldn't be able to hit an elk out at 400 yards because it's the size of a horse. You're not shooting at the size of a horse. You're shooting at this target. You're shooting at his lungs. You know, if the person who puts the crosshairs on the horse on the middle of the on the middle of that elk has got a wounded elk that's gonna that's gonna leave. One of the big problems out west that uh, is occurring and has been occurring for a long time is people taking shots at extended ranges that uh, where they, first of all. There's no indicate at that range. There's sometimes little indication left by the elk as to whether he was even struck. You don't get the you don't get the same feedback at at, at 500 yards or even 400 yards that you get immediately at 200 yards and 250 yards where you hear the bullet actually strike and you hear that whop. You know, you get immediate feedback. You know that something happened. At 300 yards, that sound disappears. You don't you don't necessarily hear it. And and an elk, um, Jack O'Connor used a he used a word uh, in uh, one of his books back in the 40s. He said uh, they're phlegmatic. They're very calm. <laughs> he, these 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 creatures, you know, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily react like a deer does. They don't jump up in the air and you know hightail it. They just simply continue to do what they were doing, and sometimes they don't leave any indication, uh, any feedback that they were struck. So sometimes somebody who has struck them absolutely with a mortal wound through the lungs and heart, or, or maybe through the paunch, that elk would just simply move along and keep on going uh, with, the, with, the same, with the same decorum that he would have done otherwise. So. It's, it's foolhardy, and, and, it's, and it's, I think it's entirely unethical. And write, write, all the, write all the nonsense that you want. It I doesn't make any difference. My job here is to tell the truth, and I'm telling you the truth. I'm a professional expert shooter. I can shoot at any distance I want to shoot, and I can hit at any distance I want to hit better than most people, absolutely better than most people from field positions. And I would certainly not take a shot at any game animal beyond 400 yards. Simple as that. If I wouldn't do it, I don't think anybody else should. And the reason is simple, because I could not possibly guarantee that my bullet sent from 400 yards away is going to arrive at the same point that I have aimed it. Because if that elk moves off target, I've missed him. I've either missed him or I've missed my point of aim, which is going to go into his intestines and cause no, no mortal damage until he basically dies of starvation uh, a few days later and, or lays down with, with cramps, and then he's left, he's left as, uh, you know, vulture bait. So, you know, you, you, ha you, you have to be very, very skeptical about all the BS writers that talk about, you know, routinely talk about these extended long-range shots. 
I frankly see it, there's, there's absolutely no reason for me whatsoever to even be interested in the least about, you know, no, these these sexy nozzle cartridges that basically all they, they, they basically just, they tear a barrel up uh, quick as can be. You can't pour, you can't pour, you know, 85, 90 or 100 grains of powder down a barrel one shot after another and not expect to have that barrel washed out. It's as simple as that. They're all overbore cartridges. Overbore meaning that the, the powder the powder capacity to the ratio of bore diameter is greatly uh, different. Um, you get you get barrel washing like it's going out of style. So uh, those 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 barrels erode very fast. Some of them blisteringly fast. I mean, some of them by the time you get your rifle properly sighted in and you've practiced with just a couple of boxes of ammo, you've already got some serious deterioration of the barrel that you spent thousands of dollars for, because those those guns are not cheap either. So that's all I have to say on that. You don't have to get too expensive about elk hunting. Uh, cartridges or, or rifles you don't have to get to you don't have to go off the mark you basically whatever you probably already have is likely to be sufficient for for elk hunting so if you've got a if you've got, got a good seven millimeter 08 if you got a good 308 those are elk cartridges they're just they're just choked up versions of uh, the 280 and the and the 3006 so you know you 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 have to, you're using the same 180 grain bullet in the 308 as you would in the, in the 3006, and you just simply, uh, you, you have to cut back maybe 20 yards or so, that's all. And it, it doesn't make any difference. There's still, there's still 300 yard cartridges easily. Um, and the 7 millimeter 08, you put a 150 grain bullet in the 7 millimeter 08, or in some, some people will claim that, you know, a good Acubond 140 grain bullet will get the job done. I don't doubt it. Um, if you, you know, 358, 358 Winchester, uh, that was the 308 case version of a 35 Whalen. Great cartridge. If you got a 35 Whalen, it doesn't get any better than that. It punches a big hole, it, it, it lets a lot of blood out, um, and, you know, it's in a 3006 size case. That, that whole family of cartridges is wonderful. So that's all I have to say on the subject. I hope you uh, enjoyed this elk hunting series. I hope it was uh, profitable for you, uh, and it certainly was fun for me. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. God bless.